I'll, I'll just come and speak and make this uh, uh, make something good for you. If they still don't buy, you say, by the way, I have written this book. I will give this book away for free. Help me, allow me to speak here, kind of thing. People, it's, it's an obvious thing when they say that if you have long-term relationships with people, uh, it's a competitive advantage. But unfortunately, there is no course in any university how to build these lasting relationships. It's almost like some people figure it out on their own and some people struggle with it throughout the life. Or some people try to build long-term relationship in the short term. Said, I want to have a long-term relationship, I want to do it now. That won't work because it just does not make sense. So I said, I wanted to provide a framework. I don't want to say the framework. I want to say a framework on how to build lasting relationships. And the background to that is that to remember that everybody in the world will have what is called as a what matters graph, like something that matters to them. It can be fame, it can be money, it can be more time with family or whatever it is. At this point in time, there is something that matters most to them. And on that graph, they are somewhere there somewhere on a scale of 10 or whatever is the scale. In five years from now, in that what matters graph, they want to be somewhere else. And that somewhere will be somewhere higher than where they are. If it is money, suppose they have a million dollars, they want to have five million dollars or whatever it is that they want to do. Now, what they, there are two zones. One is called the forbidden zone, which means they want to be somewhere there, but definitely don't want to be somewhere here which is if, if they have a million dollars, they don't want to have $200,000, right? There was that old joke, we said the easiest way to become a millionaire is to uh, first be a billionaire and then lose the remaining money kind of <laughs> problem. So you, want, you don't want to be in the forbidden zone, but you can end up in the forbidden zone if you have misjudgments or you make mistakes or make wrong decisions and those kinds of things. So where do you want to be? You want to be in the dream zone. Basically, somewhere above where you are, but what, where exactly in this dream zone depends on many factors. Your self-esteem, what you think of yourself. So uh, last uh, night I was tweeting and I said, if you don't think you can win, don't expect God to surprise you. <laughs> so basically it depends on your self-esteem like what do I think I can win do I think it starts from there and your current skill sets and the applicability of them to the marketplace your current network and your current network of help right basically who do you have that will help you get there so you want to be somewhere there if you watch TV a lot then this is how you will get from where you are to where you want to go you have a million dollars, next year you will have two, next to next year you will have three, and then four, and then five. And it seems like a really nice way of, uh, gradual way of moving, but it's only on, it happens only on TV and on movies, right, or, or in fiction. So next one is in real life, this is, where, this is how it will be. And uh, rarely will you exactly reach there, but if you do, then it will be somewhere jackpot. You will win some, you will lose some, and all those things. But what really matters is your impact on someone's what matters graph. Because everybody has it, what will be the impact you can make on somebody else's what matters graph? And you can do three ways you can impact what matters graph. Actually, there are six but the other three are not important. There are three ways. And let's, the first one is called Delta P, which is give them a performance advantage. Without you, they could have made five million. Because you are there in their life, they'll make six million. So that's a performance advantage. The next one is Delta T, which is the time advantage. Without you, they would have taken five years to make that five million. With you, they can just take four years. And you would have guessed the third one, which is the Delta P and Delta T you help them make more in less time, right? So if you are doing any one of this, uh, we are providing any one of these kinds of impacts, then already people love you because they think that you are an opportunity for them. But if you are not doing one of this, then it may seem odd, but you will be doing one of this you will be doing a negative delta P, which is like, uh, if they could do five, they will do four because you are there. Why? Because 
any time you don't make a positive impact you become an opportunity cost for the person because remember we talked about we all of us have only 24 hours they could have engaged with somebody else who could have made the positive impact in the time they are engaging with you you can make a positive impact or if you say oh, okay i'm not doing delta p delta t or delta p delta t i'll just be a maintain status quo that won't happen because they could have dealt with somebody else who will not maintain the status quo but have a positive impact or it can be delta t which is they could have done 5 million in 5 years now they take 6 years or the worst case is they will make less and take longer to make less right if so the positive delta p delta t if you are not doing it you are already doing one of the negative delta p delta t or the combination of both so if you want to do this one on one it takes a long time right because you need some tools so that you can do this in a really big way and so i have a framework for that and it's very simple let's take it this is you and then this is your network lots of you you know some of them are very close to you some of them are far away but you have a large network and it can be 100 people or it can be 10000 people and there are people who have 10000 people in their network and i'm always amazed how they even can maintain that but they they have a way of doing it and this is john one of your contacts and this is john's network again he is uh, he has some people that are close to him some people that are far away from him again it can be 100 or it can be 1000 or 10000 but when it if you want to look at the movies and apply a philosophy this will be our combined network this my network john's network combined we have a big enough network but it does not happen that way it happens in movies but not in real life but how do we do it in real life you take three people in your network bob rick and bill these three people are somebody who can make a positive delta p or delta t impact with the with john somebody can can be an opportunity for john there are three of them and you do two checks the first one is called the relevance check which is can john make a positive impact on bill okay bill can make a positive impact but can john make it probably not because it's it will be a one sided relationship so you cut off bill not not literally but just on, on the paper right so uh, next one you do a timing check so in the timing check because everybody is going through multiple things i always think that people are doing two projects at least two projects one in their professional life one in their personal life they are doing something building a home or remodeling or something or in their professional life they are trying to win a new client or something at least two but typically from my research i think they will be they will be doing between 5 and 10 projects they may not even recognize that they are involved in that many project but that's where it is so because of the time if you do a timing check the check is that if i make this connection will both of them have enough time to give attention to this connection i connect these two people but would they give the attention it truly deserves to blossom it into a relationship when you do that we'll knock off bob because bob is going through a lot of is going through an m and a or something that i can connect him but it won't work so that leaves you with uh, a potential connection of rick and john and what do you do very simple you connect and disengage it's both are very important you cannot just connect you the, the easiest way i learned this from uh, one of my other teachers tim sanders who was the chief strategy officer of yahoo he wrote a book called love is the killer app some of you might have read it and he taught me this in uh, 1999 i think he said uh, really big networkers they connect people very freely but they do it strategically that means when they connect both of them will be very happy that this connection happened so i asked uh, so after that i'm big on uh, uh, relationship building and everything so whenever i meet somebody that i respect and they have built a big network i always ask them how many people do you connect and because, just so that we have a benchmark and it will be about 300 people in a year which means they will make about 150 introductions in a year and they are not even thinking about it you meet with them and they say oh okay so gary you need to meet them boris you need to meet them they will do it so naturally because that's in their life they always are thinking who should i connect and the second part is very important you have to disengage 
you cannot say gary uh, gary wants to connect to boris and carolyn you cannot say carolyn meet with boris boris meet with carolyn and i think you might start a company but i want 10% of it so that won't work so it, you have to disengage and say carolyn meet with boris boris meet with carolyn i think there is some opportunity here please go ahead and do it and then if there is anything i can do i will but otherwise you are on your own why because it reduces the cost reduces the friction and then people have to think okay gary introduced me so what does he want and then how will it make this work and okay so we have to first have so even when they are discussing a business they are thinking okay i have to factor in gary factor here so i have to all those things will just mess up the whole thing so if you start connecting and disengaging very soon what happens boris has an obligation to gary and he think wow that was a good connection i have to do something and gary may not even be expecting but boris is thinking what can i do to help gary and the same way with carolyn is thinking what can i do to help gary because that was a really good connection and you set up a series of obligations in the world i mean it's not even if they don't do it it's fine but really what happens is it's in our human nature that you get a gift you want to say okay i have to give back a gift that's almost the power of reciprocation in play so that's what we need to do if we want to build lasting relation first go and see wh- how we can be an opportunity in somebody's life and see who else in your network can be an opportunity for that somebody's life that's how you scale and with social networks this is what makes it simple if you are on linkedin facebook and all those things you can connect to a lot of people but we don't think strategically you are not working the linkedin uh, and the facebook and those kinds of things the best way is among our network who should meet whom i mean at the end of this meeting you can think of probably like a two dozen connections that if you say wow these two people should meet and what does it take i already have a template email in uh, with me so i just have to plug in um sterling meet with boris boris meet with sterling i already have written it out and then so that if i want to make that connection the thinking is what takes more time than the implementation if it is because of linkedin and all those things it, it's even easier you can just say you know look at this profile you need to connect and then just ask ask me to introduce him to you send me a request and i'll connect that happens but if you are not using that then in linkedin will become like a glorified address book right that you might as well have it on your blackberry or something so how do we make this relationships work is is to learn the art of making powerful requests again this is an, this is something that is never taught in school like uh, if you want something we are used to when we were babies all we had to do is cry and mom will come and say hey, what do you want and then they will do it but as we grow some of us did not come out of it we just cry and say you know somebody should come and help me kind of thing <laughs> right but they never taught you want to make a request there are only three things right yes no or counter how do we make sure that we get get in yes more often than no they never thought and with that background i can tell you how to do it this is john and you want to make a request to him and you think about his what matters graph and for that to happen the fundamental skill that we need is the ability to listen most of the time people go to a meeting they come back from a meeting they didn't learn anything because most of the meeting they were talking and what will they be talking something they already knew so how can they learn by talk keep repeating the same thing that they already knew but if you listen what happens the other person talks about something very important to them just listen and then they will start talking and say you can say what is something interesting that you are working on in the last few months their eyes will lit up and then they will start explaining as if it's the best thing on earth right and uh, oh well, how does this help uh, others oh wow, how do you do this do you st- they will keep on going and talking and with that you can determine what is their what matters graph and now you want to make a request there are two requests one is a positive request which means that you make that request and while fulfilling that request they move towards their goal it's a very simple technique so you already know what is a kind of request that they will they will be glad that you did you make suppose sterling said will you come and speak at this group 
what will I do? Because I love speaking. So I said, yes, and it does not even look like work for me. But if he says, you know, the group wants to know how to prepare this Indian dish, and then I'll say, wow, I, I can't cook. I, the only thing that I can do is coffee. Other than that, I can't do anything. So it will be a costly request, right? <laughs> so you make a costly request, is you make that request, while fulfilling that request, they, it'll move them away from their goal, right? Any time you make fulfilling a request fulfilling, you got a winner. They would love to, wow, I'm so glad you asked. I mean, you can remember, you, if you look back last year, you made some requests and some people would have said, oh, I'm so glad you asked me to do that. It was a wonderful thing to do. And you were thinking, wow, you asked for some help, did, did help and they thanked you for it. Why? Because that moved them towards their goal, right? If it did not move them towards the goal, then it will be a costly request for them. The moment you make fulfilling your request fulfilling, it does not even become like a request. It becomes like an opportunity. So if you stop making requests and start creating opportunities, you're almost inviting them to participate rather than asking for some help, right? An invitation will get a higher yes than a request for help. So invitation to an opportunity, winner. Request for help, depending on what kind of request, what is the relationship you have, it might be a winner, but it has to be designed extremely well. The next one is, I, now I'll talk about some tools. The right tools and the right practices. I picked three practices and I, I took two examples. And when it comes to tools, all this social networking and all those things, I have five things that I want to talk about. The first one, if it is the right tool, you can capitalize on it. I mean, you can buy uh, a, a Kindle and use it like a book. Or you can buy a Kindle and you can totally capitalize on it. And what I did, uh, uh, I subscribed to that uh, book summaries and uh, they come to me via email, it's an eight page book summary and I could not get to, I, I'm lagging behind. And sometimes they send me more, it's like a bonus. You asked for one, we sent you 10 kind of thing. So I don't have time to read one. So uh, how will I, what will I do with the other nine? But they, they think that they're doing a favor, right? I mean, I'm really thankful to them, but I don't have time. The easiest is like uh, Kim was mentioning, you just send this to your Kindle email address and now everything is there. You are waiting for somebody to come in and then you can flip through a book summary. In five minutes you are there. So that's capitalizing on a tool. Or you can just use it like a glorified toy. So that's the first one. <clears throat> Second is to remember that tools can control you. Have you seen people who are Blackberries and uh, while you are talking they are just, uh, just one second, let me just send this email and then they are checking and all those things. That's when the tools are controlling you. The third one is tools are personal. How somebody else is using the tool should not be, should not be something that you should think that that is the way to use it. You can use the tools in the way that is that works for you. Tools, all tools are personal. How LinkedIn is used, how Facebook is used. If you listen to the experts, only thing you should remember is that that is the way it works for them. Because you are not them, so it has to, you have to make it work for you. The fourth one is popularity alone is not an indicator that you got to use this tool. It may be very popular, but if you're, suppose you can't express things in 140 characters, Twitter may not be the right tool for you because it's, there's a limit of 140 characters to tweet. And however popular it is, if, the, if it stretches you or it, if you have to struggle to use it, that may not be the right tool for you. And then last one, tools can suck up a lot of your time. Like it can be, people forget that there's, uh, there, there was a statement that uh, Dell made a million dollars using Twitter. And I, I, was, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. That's about a minute's worth of revenue for Dell. So why are they even making it a big deal? I mean, could they have not made that million without Twitter? And how many minutes did they spend to make that million dollars? So people sometimes forget the ROI because they only look at the output. They forgot how much input was given to get that return on investment. 
So for me, these are some of the tools. I'm not going to go through all of them. I organize it in three ways. For connecting, what are all the tools that I use? LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Flickr. Flickr is for organizing my photos. Aweber is for my newsletter. And then Delicious is where I store my bookmarks and those kinds of things. Ziffel is, of course, one of my portfolio companies to connecting people for meetings and all those things. And uh, if there is one tool that I think I have to mention is Evernote. Have anybody used Evernote? Yeah. So Evernote is, is like a clipping service. You go to your website and then you want, to, uh, you want it to be there, to be saved. You click a button and then it clips to Evernote. It's, it's, the good part is it's free. So and then of course there are premium features, but you <coughs> have to be a really power user to use it. And Backpacket is where I store all my documents, everything. Highrise is my personal CRM system because uh, I'm, I'm involved in multiple companies, but uh, sometimes I don't know which company's CRM I should put this particular contract. I said, I have my own CRM, let me put it in my stuff. And the next one is GIST. This is another one that I want to talk about. Uh, it's, it's not there yet, it's in beta right now. So GIST is a very interesting tool. I wish uh, well, I came up with that idea, but somebody else came up with it. So you subscribe to GIST, and then you give your LinkedIn profile, your Gmail or Outlook or anything. It will take all the contacts. Let's say there are 10,000 contacts. And then it will go to the web every now and then and get the latest that's happening on those contacts. So. The alternate way of doing it is to go to Google Alerts and then set up your client company names and all those things and then subscribe to the feeds. With GIST, it takes that thing away. It, it makes it dead simple. So whenever you are going to meet with that client, all you do is go to GIST and then see about them and the latest news and about their uh, officers and everything. If you have exchanged an email with someone, GIST will track it. And then you can tell just, oh, okay, I just exchanged, it was a sales call, don't track this person. It will not track that person. So it's, this is something that uh, is amazing. Uh, and the last one is thought leadership. I'm always uh, involved in actually all of them. So that uh, that is how I can uh, uh, be connected to readers and uh, potential partners, potential customers, uh, all those things, new friends. Now I want to use an example of, uh, so that we can see it in action. So this is when spreading the message. I wrote an article uh, which was a 300 word article. So I just want to show that you need not have to write a novel to make this work. It's a, just a 300, page, a 300 word article. It's called skip, scan, stop, save and or spread. It's very simple. So this is what we do whenever we read something online, five things. You look at it and you skip it. You say, don't want to do anything with it, nothing related to us and all that. Suppose it's about UFOs and you are not interested in it, you just skip it. Or scan. If you have read something about uh, the Federal Reserve doing something and then the same thing keeps coming in multiple networks, you look at it, I already know this, scan it and stop. The next one is stop. Stop means you think about it. Wow, this is very interesting. How will it apply to my business? This is uh, fascinating stuff there. Then you save, which means this is so interesting that I might want to read it again and again. Let me save it. The last one is spread. Wow, this is so interesting. All the people that I know should have it. This is where the viral stuff comes in, right? This is what I wrote. And then if you see, there are 24 comments. There were people who came in and they, they extended it. So uh, Seth Godin, who is a marketing guru, he came in and said, Raj, you forgot one thing. That's also an yes, and that is spam. You might treat something as spam. He says, wow, this is uh, unsolicited stuff. That's an yes. And there is one more person, I don't remember the name. She came and said, you know, Raj, you forgot one more thing. It is subscribe. Subscribe means this article is so good that I want to read every other article that this person will write in the future. Right now, I started with five and then I have uh, uh, seven because somebody else participated and enhanced it. And then 
Guy Kawasaki is an entrepreneur. So he tweeted uh, on March 3rd and he said five SS of online media and that link is to my blog post. And after that, uh, in a few minutes later, there is a person called Pro Blogger. His name is Darren Rouse. He is in Australia. And then he said, uh, you know, reading, skip, scan, and spread. It applies to blogging and Twitter. So that Guy Kawasaki's tweet and uh, the Darren Rouse tweet were retweeted about 45 times. I mean, 45 people said, you know, you should read this, you should read this, you should read this. In three hours, I had 3,000 people from all over the world visiting that just 300 word article. And uh, basically, that is the power of the social network. If you do that right, and if you have the relationships and everything, it can be a huge thing, but you have to do it. But to write that 300 word, word article took me a lot of time because, why? Because you know I'm a novelist, I can write a long letter. I can write a big novel, but to say 300 words, it's very hard for me. So it took insanely long amount of time, but once I have it, what did I do? I did it, I said, you know, who are the people that I consider as thought leaders that I'm willing to spread their message? Like there are skip, scan, stop, save, or spread. Who are the people that I consider I would want to spread? And I picked 10 of them and sent a mail saying that I just wrote an article, skip, scan, stop, save, and spread. And I just want to tell you that whatever you write, I would I love to spread it. And it's, it's almost like a gift. I talked about gifts. This is almost like a gift, is it? Because what happens in the online world is that people consume a lot, but they don't have the time to come back and thank you for it because it just takes that extra effort. So they say, wow, this is really good, and just that's it. They don't have to, because it takes, I have, they have to find an email address, they have to comment, they have to click it. They say, okay, I will do it later, and not, not because they are bad people, they just don't have the time. So I said, this is the time so that I can thank some people that I really value their content, and I, I reached out to them. And some of those people, they came back and commented, and those are the people they enhanced the post, saying this is, the, it applies here, it also applies in movies, all those things. It's the same thing, right? Some people will skip it, will, some movies will make us stop and think. Some movies, we buy it in DVDs because, you know, I want to watch it again and again. Some movies, we just talk about it all the time, like Slumdog Millionaire, and I'm telling about so many people, right? So that's the one way to uh, capitalize on social media. The second one is we talked about a book or an ebook or anything. And then some of you may be thinking, you know, book and all is good, uh, not for me. It's too much, too much. So I said, I want to demonstrate how to use social media to create an ebook. So um, over the last six months, I, whenever I was speaking, uh, it was very disturbing. Why? Because there was a majority of the crowd that were facing a layoff. So, and it's a, facing a layoff is the worst thing that can happen. Why? Because the layoff has not happened. And then now you are like, uh, you don't know what to do because the ax has not fallen and you are halfway, neither here nor there. So you are not giving your full attention to the company. At the same time, you, all, you are connected. So everybody loses. So basically the company loses because they are not getting the full amount. And then uh, you lose because you are neither here nor there. So I said, let me do something. Let me write a book called Defiant because I love the movie Defiance. I said, let me write a book called Defiance. And I said, I don't have the time to write it. Let me get help from my friends. The first thing I did, I went to LinkedIn. I think Boris, you contributed to it. Uh, I think Sterling, you contributed to it. So I posted a question saying, have a tip for someone facing a layoff. And then I said, please don't give me general stuff where everybody will already know it. Update your resume. Send it out to the recruiters. Work hard. Those are not the tips that I want. They already know it, right? It has to be something unique, something special, something that they would not have thought about. So I wrote this about 19 people responded with really good tips because they already asked 
ask them not to write some generic stuff that work with your network, those kinds of things. And I got that. Next, I posted it on my blog, saying, have a tip for someone facing a layoff. And there were 28 people who contributed. About 15 of them were good, so 13 of them were again. Although I said, don't give common stuff, they will, they don't read because people, they have to read like 600 words. They stop after reading the first paragraph and say, have a tip for someone facing layoff. I have it. Update your resume. And then I'll post it because they don't read. So about 15 of them were very good. And then I tweeted saying, this is my handle on Twitter, upbeat now. So all these people, there are probably a dozen of them who tweeted, uh, Raj is compiling a book on facing a layoff, uh, on how to face it well. So if you have a tip, send it to him. Right, then I got, finally, I, I'm almost done with the book with contributions from 50 smart people. It's a 100-page book, and I finished it in four weeks. Why? Because there is no way I could have done it alone. No way. But if you use the tools right, everybody would want to help. And it is for a good cause, because there is somebody they know is facing a layoff, and then they say, you know what? If this book comes out to be good, everybody will help. Let me help them. So the golden rule is that first do a check on the cause that you want to go after. Many times people want to use social network, I want to get more business. I'll start a Twitter, I'll get more business. No, you want to be able to contribute better using all these tools. The moment you want to do that, there will be others who will want to say, oh, he's doing some really good work, let me join hands with him. And then automatically you will get more business. That's like, that should be the side benefit of the social networks. A few practices, I picked uh, three of them. And if you want to make anything out of this talk or anything, whatever you learn, there are three things that I thought will be useful. The first one is keeping a promise that you make to yourself. The hardest thing to do is to keep a promise that you make to yourself, not to your boss or anything. Once you make a promise to yourself, it's, it's as simple as, uh, you know, I want to get up at five o'clock in the morning and then you get up at seven, and then what will you do? You will not um, bash yourself up, you will not fire yourself, you can't go anywhere because it's you. So what you will say is, you know what? There's a lot going on in my life, there's a lot. You, you don't know what's going on. It's too much and then my boss, that is like extra work and the kids didn't go to bed early. You know what? And the way you will explain is, Anybody in my position could not have woken up at five. Forget about me. Nobody could have done it. Seven is already good kind of thing. It's an explanation that you justify. In your mind, you know that it's a stupid explanation, but if you say it's stupid, then you'll have to act on it and tomorrow you have to get up at five. But if you just make it believable, right? It makes it very easy. So, and the stories that people tell will make it even more easier. And I'll pick one small example of the story of the tortoise and the hare. I mean, all of you know the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? So there is a, a quick recap. The tortoise and the hare, they run a race, and then uh, uh, the hare sleeps in the middle, and the tortoise wins. And then the conclusion is that slow and steady wins the race. And then that's what my mom told me. Uh, that's what I see uh, many moms telling their kids and say, the slow and steady wins the race. Now let's dissect this story just a bit because we are all business people. Let's dissect a bit. Let's assume that this really happened. Tortoise and the hare race happens in thousand different places in, in the world. At the same time, what are the chances that the hare will sleep in the middle of the race? Very, it's very small because unless it's a lazy hair, right? I mean, it's not a race that they're, it's not a marathon. It's a small race. Why would the hair sleep in the middle? So this is the flaw in the story. But I'm a storyteller. I have been telling stories since I was 10. I can, if you make the story really compelling, you can just eliminate the flaws because the way you tell it is the hair sleeps in the middle and then the tortoise runs, and then you're you are always thinking, what next, what next, what next? You can put some few flaws, you can introduce them, and then you conclude, which is a flawed conclusion, slow and steady does not win the race. 
but it is a good conclusion because it helps you justify some of the things that you are doing you get up late you are late with a progress report or anything you can say you know just remember the tortoise and the hare story slow and steady wins the race i may be slow by two days but you know ultimately that's what will win so it's easy to explain away many things have a flawed conclusion based on a flawed story but it's popular you ask anyone people will say i know the tortoise and the hare story slow and steady wins the race so that is what that is the kind of story that makes it difficult to keep a promise that you make to yourself my simple suggestion is to make small promises not big ones because sometimes people make a promise wow raj was speaking about writing a book this year i'll write a book and i can tell you you can't why because it takes 18 months to write it so there are only 9 months left but you can say when will i know that i didn't write a book is in december right until that time i can be in a fantasy that i will write it because i still have time so when you when the results uh, are far off it's easy to continue to be in fantasy because you you don't have to accept defeat until late in december so rather than that i say you, you know definitely think of something that you will definitely do this week and say that will be your promise and you can also get some accountability from outside suppose i made a decision to come and speak here once i do that the fact that i made a promise to sterling i was feverishly working on the presentation and everything but suppose i made a promise to myself that by 19th i will finish the presentation i can tell you honestly i would have slipped because i would have said okay something came up and this does not become important so think about what promises that you are making to yourself you can go and make to somebody else that's another small trick that you can see you know you can tell it to your uh, wife husband or your friend or your brother or your boss or anything you know please hold me accountable i want i want to do something good with my life here is a promise i was thinking just if i don't meet it i'll take you out for lunch or do something make sure you get an accountability structure but you have to start winning by winning on promises that you make to yourself if you continuously do this your self esteem will go up big because every time you say something you think wow i will do it this is this is definitely going to happen the next one is to ensure that you get high quality help requests in the areas of your strengths now think about the last few months when people called you and said uh, uh, boris can you help me with this did they ask you for help in your area of strength if they did you will become stronger because fulfilling that is a gift but if they asked you some something that you are not good at and if you don't know how to say no you lost twice because now you are doing something that you are not good at and at the same time you lost an opportunity to do something that you are good at because you are doing something something else right so if you can structure your request in such a way that uh, you know uh, you always receive high quality help requests and learn to say no like uh, i was having dinner with my um, close friend jerry riskin and we were talking about it and he said raj the art of saying no has the people have done research there is a guy called alex mckinsey from harvard university i believe he has done a lot of research on how to say no it seems like it is a really big problem of saying no and he said there are five things that you should remember on how to say no and it has to happen in a sequence and the first one is to acknowledge the request so it's, a, it's a, something like uh, you know somebody comes and asks me hey can you teach me an indian south indian dish if i don't know how to do it first you say uh, help me understand you want me to help you with a south indian dish first acknowledge because you want to know you want to know what you are saying no to the, that's the first one second one the order is very important you have to say no first not saying something like um, i wish something i don't know i will ask and then you say if you try to do anything other than no people will catch you and they will try to make you agree to something that you don't want to agree to first you say no i can't do that and the third one is to then explain why you can't do that 
because you can say that you know I will be an idiot to do this because I do not know how to cook and then uh, it, I do not want to trouble you kind of thing. The fourth one step is to provide an alternative. The, I can't do it but I have a friend who is a, who loves cooking. Let me connect you, if you want I can connect. The last one very important, this is the time to teach the other person what is a good request for you. In this case you say, no I can't do this and uh, here is the reason why I can't do this. Maybe you should talk to uh, Bob here and then let me tell you, if you had asked me anything about marketing, I would have helped you. I would have been glad to help you but cooking, I, I can't do it, help you here. This is the time to, if you keep continue to teach people the around, surrounding you to say, you know, this is the right kind of request, they will make those kinds of requests in your area of strength and suddenly you will, whatever is your area of strength, it gets stronger. That's the th second one. Third one is to find a second reason to do something significant. Anything that you are doing, anything you can find a second reason to do it. The moment you find the second reason, you find the third reason to do the same, exact same thing. What will be a third reason? Moment you find it, find the fourth reason. Why will I do it? The fourth reason. Imagine if you, uh, if you find five reasons and it need not be, it's like traveling. So I want to do, go on a consulting engagement. What will be a second reason? Maybe I have this new Kindle or I have a book, I'll finish reading in the flight. What will be a third reason? Who else is there? in the town where I am going that I have not met for a long time, I will go and meet them. What will be a fourth reason? I need to, um, uh, I always wanted to watch this play and they are playing there and here nobody will be there in the evening, maybe I will go and watch the play. I am just making up here on the fly. But once you have more than one reason, you get a double ROI from the same, because you are going to do it anyway because you have the first reason. Anything else that you get is a bonus. And if you remember this and say, why would I do this? You coming to Sunnyvale to meet with Raj, what else can I do there? And the moment you do this, it has to go into your background thinking that uh, I, anyway, I'm going to do it. What else can I do it? And here is an example. Like I, I'm coming here to speak, I'm also getting this recorded. That will be the second reason. Now I was uh, discussing with Bali here. I don't know what we will do with it, but we will find a few reasons of what to do with the DVD later, right? So, but the fact that you are thinking about multiple reasons, you will find them. If you are not thinking about them, you won't find them. That's the key. Once you have, once this becomes your background thinking, you can teach this to your employees. Why would, if your employees start doing this, you get multiple benefits because everybody is getting more out of something that they are doing. So once you, your company people start doing this, you know, the company gets like 10 times the return on one uh, small idea. The last one is to learn to ask the right questions. Like if you ask the wrong question, a pretty answer will not help. If it is the question is wrong, then whatever is the quality of the answer, that will not help. In fact, we don't even have to ask new questions. We can reframe existing questions. We can ask the same question in a different fashion I, and I picked uh, uh, five examples. First one, how can I sell to them? This is one question. This is a valid question, how can I sell to them? But you can reframe it and say, who can I become so that they want to buy from me? It is a, it's the same question but you know, one is I selling to them, the other is they wanting to buy from me. This one will be a pull, this is a push. That's the reframe. And the second, why is this happening to me? Constantly we keep, why, is, why does this happen to me? Why me? Why me? Kind of thing. The reframe will be what am I learning from this? This was how, how I would reframe it because everything is an experience. Then I was uh, talking to Sterling and he did another reframe on this. And he said, how am I contributing to this? Why is this happening to me? Maybe you are doing something to make that happen to you. So this is, I don't know whether you remember this, Sterling. <laughs> this is what you changed it. Well, I'll so, take credit for it. Yeah, <laughs> it's yours, I have to do that. So this is a reframe. Same question, 
but this is these two are more powerful than the question because why is this happening to me what if you know the answer what if you don't know the answer but if you say what am i learning from this suddenly you will become a student second how am i contributing to this you will also see what practices led to it so that you don't repeat them once again why should i be proud of working for my company this is something that uh, uh, constantly happens especially for uh, employees uh, like big companies like microsoft and uh, those kind uh, oracle and all of them when i speak in india some people will come and i ask them uh, at the end of speaking when they come and talk to me i ask them what do you do so they say oh, i work for microsoft i say okay so what do you do in microsoft it's like they are so proud of working for that company they forget to ask this question why should my company be proud that i am working for them so the first one is a good job that the company does so that everybody is proud of them proud of working belonging to this this is a job that they have to do so that the company is proud that they are part of part of them how many people should i know we talked about networking and all those things i mean there it's a never ending story because there are people who know 10000 people and those it's like how much money should you have kind of until you reach bill gates you can keep wanting to have more and more and more so the real question will be how many right people should know me as a valuable resource it's not how many you know it's how many people want consider you as a valuable resource in your area of expertise and they can reach out to you and all those things the last one seems like a philosophical question and then this when this is a common question in the recession and all those things is say do i matter right or do i matter and then change a small make a small change and say how do i matter suddenly it becomes more powerful do i matter how do i matter <clears throat> that's all for the prepared part and uh, thank you so much for giving this opportunity here